Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Phil Duxbury, Dean of the College of Natural Science, and I will be your MC for today. Thank you for joining us on this momentous occasion for the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Bio Biology, the College of Natural Science and the University. <coughs> as we honor Bjorn Hamburger and Ben Orlando as James K. Billman, Jr. Endowed Professors. I am delighted to share that the donor of these prestigious awards is here today. Dr. Billman is with us. <coughs> Jim, thanks for being here and for your many contributions to Michigan State and to the college. I'm also pleased to share that Professor Amy Ralston is also here with us today. Amy is the inaugural uh, James K. Billman, Jr. Endowed Professor. She conducts pioneering research to investigate how genes regulate stem cell behavior in the context of the mammalian em embryo, with the long-term goals of devising innovative stem cell therapies and improving pregnancy outcomes. Kristen Parent, who couldn't be with us today, is the inaugural J.K. Billman Jr. Endowed Research Professor. So there's two types of professors here. One, one's got research in it, and the other does not. <laughs> but both are research. <laughs> so, um, and she conducts pioneering research with cryoelectron microscopy, which we're upgrading at the moment. We're looking forward to great things from that upgraded facility. Uh, and uh, she does 3D image reconstruction methods to better understand the underlying mechanisms that control virus infection and the processes of virus assembly. Amy, it's great to have you here today. <laughs> and of course, a big welcome and thanks to Ben and Bjorn's family members, colleagues and lab members for being here today. Okay, on with the celebration. Our program today will touch on the importance of the James K. Billman, Jr., MD, a lot of names, symbols there, uh, Endowed Professor and the J.K. Billman, Jr., MD, Endowed Research Professor designations, and the long-term impact that endowed faculty positions have on the continued excellence of our university. These professorships are absolutely vital these days. There's a big competition around the country, and the fact that we have generous donors willing to help us attract the very best and retain the very best is absolutely essential. Let me personally congratulate Dr. Hamburger and Dr. O uh, Orlando for their outstanding achievements to date, which we recognize by these pre uh, prestigious endowed professorships. Following a few remarks and brief introductions of Ben and Bjorn from Biochemistry and Molecular Biology Chair Olorusian Ogunwobi, or Sean, Sean Ogunwobi, and we will hear from our honoree, uh, honorees and have their formal investitures. Finally, Dr. Billman will provide a few remarks to close today's investiture ceremony. With that, I'll turn the program over to Doug Gage, Vice President for Research and Innovation at Michigan State, who will make a few remarks. Doug, thanks for being here today. So I'm extremely pleased to be here today to help uh, honor Professors Hamburger and Orlando as they are inducted into uh, uh, the J.K. Billman uh, Junior Endowed Professorships. You know, uh, if you go to these events very often, you'll see Dr. Billman here frequently, and that, that is a, a testimony to his generosity to the university. And I see Dean Forger back there, who is also, uh, the College of Music has also been a, a, a great recipient of, of his generosity. So I thank you, Dr. Billman, for that. Uh, as Phil said, you know, endowed professorships are really uh, critical to our success. Uh, this is something that really allows us to compete at the highest level. Faculty uh, of, of uh, Bjorn and uh, Ben's quality are constantly being recruited by other institutions. We can keep them here with some uh, recognition. And it's not so much, I think, uh, uh, about financial support is, is recognition by their peers and by their faculty. That, that really is really the, the, the most important thing. So I, I, I couldn't say more about how, how critical that is. Um, you know, uh, one of the things about an endowed professorship is that no matter what the economic uh, conditions of the day, they, they are, you know, that uh, endowment is retained and it will exist long beyond 
uh, Ben and, and Bjorn's retirement, certainly beyond my retirement. Uh, and uh, so I, I think that's something that is also the, the perpetual nature of these things is just is really critical. And I don't think you can make a more important gift to the institution. Uh, I wanted to say a little bit about Ben and uh, Bjorn. <clears throat> Maybe it says a little bit about my own age, but I know I, I helped recruit Ben here as a Global Impact Initiative faculty member. Uh, I met him when he was a candidate here. I think he impressed all of us, and, and he's here today, so I thank you for that. And Bjorn, who is a, a great innovator in metabolic engineering, my own area of interest, uh, I think I was here when he arrived as well. So that, that's another, uh, another uh, I, I guess, indicator of my uh, age. But uh, it's great to honor both of these and, and my, my home department, biochemistry. Uh, so it is, it's just, it's really great, Dr. Melman, that, that you uh, constantly have, have stepped up to, to help the university. So thank you again. So I'll turn it back to Phil. <laughs> Thanks, Doug, for those, those uh, inspiring words. So, as Doug said, these professorships are awarded only to the most outstanding faculty, and we have outstanding faculty to in, uh, have uh, this investiture for today. The impact of these types of endowed positions is much broader than just those individuals, as it enables them to attract the best students, postdocs, colleagues, and it helps us as a community keep on improving. <clears throat> Together, all these aspects help ensure that our future alumni will have the education and experience they need to compete for the best jobs and to lead the nation and world in maintaining and building scientific leadership, which is the primary mission in the research sphere of our college. Ben and Bjorn, we're looking forward to great things, building on what you've already achieved. With that, I'd like to invite Dr. Sean uh, Ogan Wobi, Chair of the Department of uh, Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, to the podium to say a few words on behalf of the department and to introduce today's first honoree, Ben Orlando. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really very pleased to be here. Thank you, Phil, for uh, inviting me to join this uh, uh, gathering this afternoon. Um, this is a really special occasion. It's my first as chair of the Department of uh, uh, Biochemistry and Molecular Biology uh, to be able to bestow this great honor on Bjorn and, and Ben, uh, this endowed professorship, the Billman J.K. endowed professorships. Um, I'd like to add my voice to the gratitude that everyone has expressed to Dr. Billman uh, for establishing these uh, professorships. But before I introduce Ben, I'd like to just uh, make a few comments on the importance of these professorships. Uh, actually, I was walking to this center, uh, my first time here uh, with Amy, and I was telling her that I was going to mention how it's so important uh, for these endowed professorships to enable junior and mid-career uh, faculty members to be able to accelerate their research. Uh, these professorships provide a necessary flexibility uh, for them to explore innovative ideas that uh, may be uh, not competitive for funding uh, by NIH and other um, federal and state agencies that often require a tremendous amount of preliminary data and um, some people feel they tend to fo fund incremental research in, in some cases. Whereas these endowed professorships allow our faculty to be able to explore um, out of the box ideas even uh, to then accelerate their research, gather the preliminary data to be competitive for this uh, 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 federal and state and other uh, foundation funding. So we're very grateful. And so it's now time to um, introduce one of our honorees, uh, Ben Orlando. Uh, so this is a very great honor for Ben. He's a proud alumnus of uh, Michigan State University. He came back to us um, after leaving Michigan State University. He uh, came back to us after completing doctoral training at the State University of New York at Buffalo and postdoctoral training at Harvard University. He joined the department as an assistant professor in 2020, which is a big deal given what we all know happened in 2020. But 
that did not stop Ben from being very productive. He has achieved extraordinary things, including receiving an NIH R35 uh, award. And uh, since his time here, he's published uh, three high-impact publications in journals such as the Journal of Biological Chemistry, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and Nature Communications, uh, high-impact journals. And he's been invited to uh, give high-profile national and international talks, among many other honors. And so in recognition of these achievements, the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology was very proud to nominate him for the J.K. Billman Jr. MD Endowed Research Professorship. It is now my greatest honor and privilege to invite to the podium uh, Dr. Ben Orlando to tell us about his amazing research. Okay, well, thank you, Sean, uh, Dean Duxbury, and Doug. It's my pleasure to be here. Dr. Billman, it's phenomenal to meet you. And I will try today in a short 10 minutes to give everyone an overview of what we work on in my lab and hopefully convince you why seeing is believing and visualizing the structure and dynamics of membrane protein complexes is going to propel us into the future. And so I like to tell everyone what I do in simple terms by starting with an image that unfortunately we've all become familiar with over the past several years. And if you were to look at this virion, if you could take these spike proteins on its surface and look deeper down into its molecular architecture, you would get a protein structure that looks just like this. And it's the structure of this spike protein that allows specific antibodies to recognize that structure. And if you wanted to dive deeper and develop a small molecule drug, such as Paxlovid, that targets uh, one of the proteins that's encoded in this virus, you would need exquisite molecular detail peering down into the atomic level of those drug binding pockets. And this leads me to one of my favorite quotes in science from Dr. Linus Pauling. It is the structure that we look for whenever we try to understand anything. All science is built upon this search and we like to understand and explain observed facts in terms of structure. And at its core, that is what my lab is really all about, is understanding the structure of biological macromolecules and how that structure relates to function. So while I don't work on viruses, I work on a similar emerging global threat, and that is drug-resistant drug uh, bacteria that pose an infectious threat to humans. If you were to look down at the cell wall of these bacteria, you would get a picture such as this which, with a thick outer layer of peptidoglycan. And this layer needs to be continually synthesized through an elaborate biochemical process that involves many different lipid intermediates. This cycle needs to continue uh, or else the bacteria will die and thus it becomes no surprise that there are many antimicrobial compounds that target intermediates of this cycle. Some of these you're probably familiar with. Everyone in this room has probably at some time in their life used Neosporin which is a small circular peptide that binds to these lipids. Similarly, vancomycin, one of our antibiotics of last resort, is used only in treatment of very difficult uh, bacterial infections. And so this here is a structure of bacitracin in gray bound to its target uh, lipid here in yellow. And the overarching question we've been trying to answer is how do bacteria sense and resist these peptide complexes once they bind to the cell surface. And one of the ways in which they will do this is once a peptide recognizes its target lipid at the surface of the bacterium, there are antimicrobial resistance complexes called BCE modules that look like this. Once this complex is recognized, it sets off a cascade of biochemical events, ultimately leading to gene transcription that further upregulates the complex to mediate resistance against the peptide. And so what my lab is really focused on is trying to understand at the molecular and even down to the atomic level, what these complexes look like and how they perform this overall cascade of biochemical events. To do that, we use a technique called cryo-electron microscopy. And you can put your purified protein complexes onto a very small grid that looks like this. This is one of those grids held in the tip of tweezers. And the overarching goal is to trap your purified protein complexes 
in these holes on the surface of this grid and freeze them in time, basically by forming a glass-like ice layer. This entire grid then gets loaded into a very large and fancy electron microscope. This is the one that we have here on campus. As Doug mentioned, soon to be expanded into a much bigger and more powerful facility. And the overarching goal of this microscope is simply to pass a beam of electrons down through your sample. And as the electrons interact with the proteins that are captured in that ice, they are scattered and recollected and hit a detector to generate a 2D image of your individual proteins suspended in ice. We can collect thousands of these images, extract all of the individual particles, and begin to average them in two dimensions to improve the signal to noise ratio. And these particles can also be back projected in three dimensions to ultimately produce uh, maps in 3D that allow us to build an atomic model amino acid by amino acid of whatever target protein you are going after. So to give you a visualization of this process at work, we took a BCE transporter from Bacillus subtilis, overexpressed this and purify it. And so this is the resulting chromatogram and lane five is the purified protein consisting of the membrane spanning region and the nucleotide binding domain here. This went into thin ice and was imaged on our microscope here at MSU, generating an image of individual proteins that look like this. And as you begin to average these in two dimensions, we get the world's first view at exactly what this protein complex actually looks like. And to put this into perspective, if you were to take a 0.5 millimeter piece of pencil lead, you could fit about 2.5 billion of these particles on the very tip of that pencil lead. So this shows you the absolute power of this new microscope technology. We can eventually back project these and obtain three-dimensional maps that we can then build atomic models into de novo and get models and capture these complexes in a variety of different states using molecular biology and biochemical tools to see how they are assembled in the cell and change conformations in response to binding of ATP or antimicrobial peptides and other ligands. And so if we take all of this data, we can then begin to build those atomic models and see how this protein changes shape in response to binding of small molecules like ATP, and eventually put together molecular movies from snapshots of all of these different conformations that look a little bit like this. And so we can peer down into the atomic world and actually see how these proteins change shape in response to binding of specific ligands. And so this is some of what we have done so far. Looking to the future, we're expanding all of this work into more pathogenic strains to understand how some of the world's most dangerous pathogens evade some of our most powerful medications. And so Dr. Billman, I wanna thank you for your investiture. I greatly look forward to updating you on our progress of this through the years. And lastly, I wanna thank all of the people who did the hard work um, it certainly was not all me. Um, this is the Orlando lab here. All of the work that you saw here was performed by a very talented graduate student, Natasha George. I want to thank everyone at MSU who is, has made and continues to make CryoEM a reality, including Sundar and Kristen. Some of the data you saw was collected earlier on at Purdue, NIH for funding, and most importantly, Dr. Billman for this endowment which is going to allow us to propel this into the future. So, thank you. Thank you, Ben. That was inspiring. And uh, that's a big problem. We need people like you to find solutions to, to, to that problem. So it's exciting to have that research here. So now I'd like to uh, invite um, Professor Sean ogan Woby back to the stage uh, to in introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Phil. Uh, that was uh, nice to see what Ben does. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bjorn Hamburger. Uh, Bjorn joined the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology in 2015 after completing doctoral training at the Max Planck Institute for Plant Breeding Research. I completed his postdoctoral training in the Department of Botany uh, at the University of British Columbia in Canada, 
and also at the Michael Smith Laboratories in University of British Columbia in Canada. Prior to coming to uh, MSU, Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, he was faculty um, at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark for five years. As I mentioned, he joined us uh, in 2016 as an assistant professor, uh, but he's done phenomenally well. He's uh, completed six extramurally funded projects, actually more than that. He's filed uh, five patent applications and published 35 peer-reviewed papers in highly impactful journals. Uh, in addition to this, Bion has been very active giving talks nationally and internationally, reviewing grant applications both nationally and internationally, and is trained highly successful and diverse uh, PhD students and postdoctoral trainees. Uh, his current research program is actively funded by grants from the uh, Department of Energy, the National Science Foundation, among others. And so in recognition of all of these accomplishments, uh, we're very proud, uh, the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, to, rec uh, to recommend him for uh, this prestigious uh, professorship, the James K. Billman Jr. MD and Dow Professorship in 2022. It's my honor and privilege to invite Dr. Bjorn Hamburger to the podium to tell us about his amazing research. Sean, thanks so much for the fantastic introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. All right, um, so 10 minutes to talk uh, about research interests. This is really hard. Now, um, <laughs> what I did is really unique, and, and I hope you'll bear with me, because there will be uh, pretty much zero text on any of those slides. Now, I'm, uh, I am uh, really interested in building things. Um, this is a uh, Lego model that I built with uh, our daughter earlier. And uh, you will see a recurring um, scheme of Legos throughout this talk. Now, this is a molecule that I was introduced to during my uh, undergraduate studies. Uh, absolute spectacular anti-cancer drug that is uh, effective against fast-growing um, breast cancer, fast-growing lung cancers. Uh, its name is Taxo, and it is made by the Pacific yew tree. Now, at that time, I was absolutely stunned about the earliest synthetic routes in labs in uh, formal chemical synthesis, which took about 15 steps and had a yield just under a percent. Now, at that point, I made two realizations. The first one was that I will never be as brilliant as those um, chemists that devised those strategies. The second one was that I really felt that the Pacific yew tree was very effective in making this compound. Um, shouldn't this be an inspiration? Now, at the same time, there was a trend also towards uh, more sustainable futures, uh, biosustainable societies that rely less and less on petrochemistry. So this really became my motivation to move into plant biochemistry. Um, the image on the left side is actually in Michigan. Um, in about 2000, uh, in about the year 2000, about three and a half million ornamental Pacific yew trees were planted on the Upper Peninsula towards a goal of becoming more sustainable. Now, these can be harvested every couple of years, and you can see a nice example right there where the harvester goes over those shrubs and takes off just the top. So this is very sustainable. Now, as we move on, uh, let's talk about uh, specialized metabolites. Uh, many of those are very well known, and we have examples here from uh, resveratrol. This is a compound found in red wine. Um, then we have a notorious example here from uh, alkaloids or opioids. And on the bottom here, we have uh, specialized metabolites um, found in mustard. Now, there is one big mystery box that's missing here, and these are terpenoids. We are very excited about terpenoids. They are the largest and oldest family of specialized metabolites on our planet. Now, here is an example. This is uh, the reason why plants make terpenoids. Uh, reason number one, plants cannot run away. So they have to have very efficient ways of defending themselves. And here you can see an example 
that dates back 350 million years. Conifer trees are very good in defending themselves against these little bugs that drill holes. Now, this example here is amber, and these are actual terpenoids made by conifer trees. Now, here is another example why plants make terpenoids, and this is interaction with the environment and, and clearly communication. On the left-hand side here, you can see attraction of pollinators by terpenoids made in flowers. And on the right-hand side, I have already included an example why humans are really excited about terpenoids for thousands of years. And this, this is an example for volatiles, so very small molecules. Um, and this is an example of a uh, perfume that dates back to uh, ancient Egypt. Now, as terpenes become much, much larger, they are not volatile anymore. But we still rely on them for critical functions, for example, in caoutchouc. Now, this is an important billion-dollar industry because humans have not managed to mimic the chemistry or the uh, physical properties of caoutchouc uh, synthetically. Now, famously seen here in the tires of uh, spacecraft that are landing, they can do that because they still rely on, on caoutchouc. So, as we move um, forward for humans and, and human interests, humans recognize terpenoids um, for about known 60,000 years. This here is an example of a Neanderthal uh, pre-homo sapiens who was buried with flowers that we now recognize for their medicinal values as uh, wormwood, yarrow, and, and famously <coughs> ephedra, the source of ephedrine. Now, here are modern uses of terpenoids that span a broad spectrum of values from um, cosmetics all the way up to drugs such as uh, foscolin and, and picato. These are molecules that we have worked with in the past. We have, for example, cracked the pathway to foscolin for biosynthetic production. And this is where the Legos come into the game. I would like to take a brief moment to talk about what our lab is very excited about, and this is synthetic biology. We are learning from the plants how these pathways function. The reason for that is that with this knowledge, we can engineer biotechnological hosts for production outside of the plant, and that has significant advantages. First off, we can do this by fermentation. This is um, uh, very process-oriented and, and industry-friendly. The second is we don't have to go out into the wild and harvest those plants anymore. So we are working towards biosustainable solutions that will help us for a greener society. Now, with that, I would like to get to a few examples because we are really excited about members of the mint family. These are loaded with terpenoids. You know them because they have very characteristic smells and flavors, but they accumulate a broad range of bioactive molecules that uh, we can use uh, for development of novel drugs or that are even recognized as drugs. Now here I would like to come to a very concrete example of research in the lab. And with that, I would really like to thank uh, Dr. Billman for the support because this is a project that has definitely benefited from um, his contribution to our lab. Now, I would like to highlight Abby and Emily. These are two PhD students uh, on our team. Uh, actually, Emily has since then um, uh, earned her PhD and moved to Virginia Tech. But this project investigated the evolution of new chemistries in the mint family over a spectrum of 70 million years. And um, while this slide is very complex, I included it because it, I, I find it on an abstract perspective quite, quite attractive. But what it does show is how conserved genes are across all members of the mint family where uh, Abby and Emily looked at. And, and this is how new chemistries emerge. Now, the second example I would like to provide um, what, where uh, Dr. Billman's endowment has uh, helped us tremendously is uh, organization of the first symposium for indigenous connections here at Michigan State University this year. Um, this is speaker Isabel um, Pini. She is from the University of Quebec, and the endowment has allowed us to um, 
organize this symposium and invite speakers, including a fantastic student who has built connections in, in South America. Now, Isabel here talked about her own background as a native um, person in Canada, and she is professor in biochemistry in Quebec. This was absolutely inspiring, and, and this definitely went outside of the box and beyond what we could have pulled off otherwise. Now, um, and the research that I have talked today about, uh, this is not my contribution. People um, are in the audience. This is, this is our team, and they are the ones working hard in the background. And uh, with that, I would like to thank Jim again for this fantastic opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Bjorn, for another wonderful presentation. And now we get to the hardest part of the event, and that is handing out the medals. And uh, I'd like to invite uh, VP Doug Gage to, to, to do that. <clears throat> Thank you, Doug. It's now my pleasure to introduce the donor behind these prestigious endowed positions, Dr. James Bellman, who will provide the closing remarks for today's program. Jim received his bachelor's in biochemistry with high honor from Michigan State's Honors College in 1969 and his MD degree at Ohio State University in 1973. Uh, he sub subsequently trained in the specialties of anatomic and clinical pathology at the University of Michigan. Following medical practice as a pathologist in the U.S. Air Force Medical Corps, he joined the Quad Cities Pathologists Group, serving Western Illinois and Eastern Iowa, and enjoyed a long and successful career in pathology and laboratory medicine. Dr. Billman's support of Michigan State to date includes the two endowed professorships we are recognizing today which he established to be awarded and held on a five-year term basis by a series of exceptional assistant professors in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. In addition, he has endowed 22 scholarships for undergraduates, many of which are in the College of Natural Science, including three for BMB. Dr. Billman was also the lead donor for the Music Pavilion Project, a long-needed addition and improvements to the 80-year-old MSU Music Building on West Circle Drive. Without further ado, it is my honor to acknowledge and honor uh, Dr. J.K. Billman to the podium. <clears throat> well, I'd like to uh, thank uh, both uh, Amy and Kristen for their service and I hope that uh, Orlando and Bjorn can follow their route and become uh, full professors within five years as their, <laughs> their mentors have done. Uh, although I've uh, been to multiple schools now, and I like Ohio State, and I like the University of Michigan, but I love Michigan State. So uh, I've uh, found this to be a uh, very enjoyable thing, and I always enjoy following what happens in biochemistry, though, even though I don't understand very much of it anymore. <laughs> so good luck, and uh, we'll be watching your progress. Thanks. Thank you, Jim, and congratulations again to Ben and Bjorn. That concludes our formal program for today, and now we have a celebration just next door, so stay and uh, enjoy some refreshments. 
Those of you who came up to the podium or were engaged in the program need to hang around a little bit as we have our photographers who want to take some pictures. So please uh, wait a few minutes and, and then we'll finish it off. So thank you again, everybody, for coming. It's great to see you here. Thank you.